All right, now um, let's immediately go to our keynote speaker, uh, Professor Juan Urgreca. I have some introduction. Uh, Juan, I know that you don't like all these introductions and stuff. I know that, but uh, you see, everyone has a responsibility, and this is mine. So uh, you can keep your ears, but I'm going to have to say, and this is the truth. Okay, so I'm truly honored to introduce Professor uh, Juan Urgreca, Distinguished Professor of Linguistics and Director of the School of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures at the University of Maryland. He is widely regarded as one of the greatest figures in linguistics and a huge intellectual impact for a large community of linguists around the world. He is the author of many influential books and articles in the field and has inspired many syntacticians and biolinguists to search for the mathematical, physical, and biological foundations of human language faculty. His latest characterization of the language faculty matrix syntax is a formal model of syntactic relations. It assumes that a fundamental divide in human language is between nouns and verbs, which are conceptually at right angles, and that such a conceptual orthogonality may be treated formally in a fricter space. Under simple assumptions, the resulting mathematical structure resembles aspect of quantum mechanics as stated in the structure of a group that include polys. Professor Greca's understanding of and commitment to the scientific method, rationality, abstraction, and explanation continue to this day to pioneer our understanding of human nature and in particular the generative enterprise. Categories, features, and interactions within levels is the title of his talk, one that he is unveiling for the very first time, I believe. Please now join me in welcoming Professor Greca to this event. Thank you. And please don't kill me. <laughs> no, thank you, thank you. Um, but now, I have a practical question about um, the, the um, uh, PowerPoint that we uploaded uh, last week. Do you... Okay, so um, uh, you can go to the files. Do you see, like... Yeah, this? I'll go to the files. Should I, should I download it or just play no, it? No, 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 just click play. Play, okay. So Wonderful. let me see. If, does it show there? Yes, yeah. we have it. Okay, excellent. Wonderful. Okay, so without uh, further, um, you know, fluffy stuff, let's just go to the science. We're scientists, so let, let's see what we can say about it. Um, I, um, like like uh, all of you, I'm, I'm interested in, in um, uh, as I was saying, wh where and when I language. I mean, it is, uh, uh, Chomsky often talks about language crystallizing at some point in, in the human uh, experience, um, um, presumably within the evolution of our species, because we don't see chimp cousins exhibiting this behavior, at least we don't see it at, at, at an externalized version, but what does it mean to crystallize? Uh, do we mean crystallize in a serious sense when, you know, the way, the way somebody uh, does in crystallography? Uh, what kind of structure would that mean if that's what is meant? And if not, is this a metaphor? And if if so, is it a useful metaphor? And so on. This is this is where I'm coming from. Now, um, in particular, I um, although what uh, Mustafa has just just said is is absolutely uh, uh, historically correct. What I'm trying to do is just looking at nouns and verbs, uh, ideas that really go back to uh, Varro, if not Panini. Um, um, I would like to connect those orthogonalities, those distinctions between verb and noun, um, to other distinctions that seem equally basic, uh, in particular between um, consonant and vowel, also uh, extreme, uh, extremely different uh, areas within, in that case, uh, phonology. Um, you will see as, as I advance in the talk why uh, I am attempting that. But this really starts with models of uh, uh, speech uh, production and perception. I am mentioning here my favorite simply because, you know, I worked with Dave Pepple and I think this particular, the way I read it is an, as an instantiation of an old analysis by synthesis approach, which goes back to uh, some of our, uh, I, I'd say our, uh, in the sense that Doug Sadi was, uh, uh, you know, at MIT working with, uh, Tom Bever and, and, and others in that tradition of analysis by synthesis. The key aspect of analysis by synthesis that I want you to bear in mind is feedback loops. And that, not, not, I'll emphasize that in a moment. But in any case, starting with that particular model in speech, um, the question is, can we 
generalize from that very tangible uh, uh, domain where we can actually measure things very accurately simply because it's presumably much more mundane to talk about consonant vowels and the like than to talk about predicates, subjects, and to talk about all the other things that are equally real, but much harder to observe. That's where I'm coming from there. Okay, so with that in mind, um, as I said, the feedback loops uh, uh, that you observe there uh, are extremely interesting in, um, in particular in what is called speech imagery. I don't know how familiar you are with this, but present, present technology allows us, and, and this is a photograph of uh, Joan Orpella, uh, who recently has uh, written about a paradigm where you effectively get speakers to think about what they're about to say. And you actually uh, measure uh, their the movement of their lips and jaws to, to control that they aren't really uh, using those muscles so that it isn't a motor stuff at all. So you have to control, first of all, for that. They do very carefully. And then try to concentrate on what they're thinking as they plan, for example, a word like, ta or a syllable like ta, or a word like papa, and so on, okay? And, and you measure that very carefully. In this case, with MEG, although you could use different uh, techniques. So that's the paradigm that I'm uh, very interested in, in uh, potentially generalizing. I mean, I'm actually trying to get Orpella to, uh, to go from what I'm about to show you at the domain of syllables to then uh, expand this speech imagery to the domain of words. And I don't know if I'll see it in my lifetime, but ideally uh, uh, sentences, et cetera. Okay, so um, this already begins to be some of the actual uh, neuroimaging, um, uh, of course, it's already uh, uh, passed okay. through matrix analysis so that you are, you don't just get raw signals, but th this is the kind of stuff that Doug and uh, Peter Graven and others have been uh, very uh, eager to show us ways of analyzing from the physics perspective so that you basically start seeing lumps of information uh, spatially, but also crucially in temporal slices. So what you're seeing in that diagonal there in the middle are effectively seven, a total of seven um, sub, sub, mental sub-events. As, as, uh, uh, think of it this way. Um, you, um, uh, uh, here we are dealing with productions of consonants and vowels in a syllable like ta, ti, tu, that sort of thing. And as your, your mind really goes through a process of, if this, is, if this model is correct, seven different sub-events um, before the thing comes out, right? So, so you're planning all of this, you feed back uh, the information that the plan was correct uh, in, in some internal state, and then uh, eventually uh, come up with a production. Now, in, the, in this particular instances, you're not even focusing on the production. This is really all imaged, okay? And nonetheless, there's still seven uh, different uh, sub-events. Um, here in this slide, um, the, the, the emphasis here is, 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 is really what I'm calling the first take home message, the feedback loops, because those seven sub-events are actually divided in four and three in sequence. And uh, at, in the middle, in the fourth, it, there really is a feedback loop that basically confirms, yep, that's correct. Again, you're not doing this consciously, obviously, but the, the, the mechanism is telling you, yes, you, you were targeting a cop or you were targeting an ah, and indeed uh, that was uh, th that hypothesis turned out the way you wanted it, so go on with the next one. Um, okay, so. Now, in this one, in this uh, slide, what I want you to focus on is the difference between the vowel and the consonant. After all, this is what I'm trying to uh, begin to help us isolate. Signals like ah versus k, and um, to see to what extent the brain processes those, the, the brain, uh, is, the word isn't process, plans the information for each of those differently, not just in so much, we already know that there are different areas, but also in different times, okay? Now, basically what this slide is telling you, 
and, and there's a little quote there by Joan Orpella, um, that indeed the, the, the timing of the consonant and the timing of the vowel are quite different. Um, now, of course, in the particular experiment he's done, uh, you could say, well, this is because the way he organized the syllable has that particular order into it because he chose a canonical consonant vowel syllable. I was telling him we should try this with the opposite order and it hasn't been done yet. So we're gonna have to make do with what we have in front of us. But the important point here is this. It seems as if indeed for uh, the vowel, um, you are concentrating on something that is a longer period and is, is further in time vis-a-vis uh, -vis the consonant which is shorter and earlier. And if you think of it, uh, in one instance, uh, the acoustics of the vowel basically are worrying about fundamental frequencies, um, performance, whereas in the, in the case of the consonant, you really are worrying about more the articulation. Each consonant is very similar, it's particularly stop consonants are very similar um, among one another. What you worry about is the effect they have on the vowel, or if you wish, the kind of turbulence that they produce. So they're very different types of entities and the brain takes them very differently. Now, with that in mind, uh, this is really what this uh, uh, slide is basically uh, showing you. It's, it's th This slice is, on the uh, first of all, giving you a bunch of vowels in the middle with the usual spectrograms. And then it's just comparing the use of one of those as a, as a glide, like yup or uh, whip, right? There you, it's acting consonantally, whereas in the other case, uh, as in, for instance, uh, peas or push, uh, it's acting as a vowel, right? Uh, now, that difference is the one I'm interested in, right? I mean, I'm trying to hear control, and this, again, this hasn't been done, and I would love to be able to do this with them. As far as I know, this hasn't been done with the kinds of imaging speech, uh, speech imaging that I was talking about, but uh, the idea would be to just take the virtually the same entity, the same uh, signal, and put it in a consonantal and a vocalic domain and see whether, how it is that uh, the brain is planning each of those given the differences that we are seeing. And part of the differences that we are seeing is what I want to generalize and see whether we can extend this beyond uh, signals like uh, consonants. Um, now, if you even ask your, yourself what, what a spectrogram is, or if you go back to, to, to what is, why spectrograms are so useful, well, there you go smack into Fourier analysis, right? You go into um, correlated variables. In the case of vowels, you have frequency, fundamental frequency, and uh, time. And um, depending on uh, your uh, focus on the analysis, you're going to get... Let me see if the next slide shows it. You're going to get, yes. Um, here you get, in, in the first instance, I'm showing you a wide, uh, a, a, a wide band spectrogram. Wide band means basically that you're taking um, a very small time window. So, so you chuck it into little pieces, which allows you to focus uh, with extreme resolution on, on the uh, <coughs> time uh, version. Right, so that's that, that's going to be very good for the consonants. That's what the um, top uh, uh, image shows. Does my cursor move uh, when you you guys uh, see it on the other end? Can you see my cursor moving? No. That, I'm sorry. That's a question for uh, someone in the audience. Can you see my cursor moving? No, we cannot see that moving. Yeah, we can. We cannot. Okay, all right, thank you. Well, so um, I'll just then talk about it. I mean, I suppose that the interface doesn't allow me to do that. I was referring to the top uh, part of the image where you, you basically have it, uh, again, with, uh, with wide uh, band spectrogram. So that's going to be very good for a time-dependent unit like a consonant, whereas if you go in the other direction, if you go into a narrow band uh, spectrogram, that is going to be very good at getting you the frequency dependency. So it's going to be better for the vowels. You get a more continuous picture of the frequency. So my only point here is that you have a trade-off, right? You In a spectrogram, as in any other situation where you have correlated variables within a, a, a wave analysis, you could either go in the direction of one of the variables to the price of not of getting effectively uncertainty on the other, or vice versa. You can go 
towards certainty in the, in the correlated variable, in this case frequency, uh, to the expense of uh, uh, certainty on the time one. So that trade-off, um, that trade-off, um, uh, it, it doesn't really matter at, in Fourier analysis, you don't care what the substance of the wave is. In this case, of course, we are looking at, um, at acoustic waves, but we could equally well <coughs> be looking at, at brain waves of any, of any kind. And of course, this is part of what we will have to be doing because this is what we're recording, brain waves. Uh, but equally, we could be looking at um, abstract waves like probability waves. And uh, for the relevant correlated variables there, in, the, in terms of the frequency of the wave and the timing of the wave, the exact same issues arise. You could, uh, this is what that statement uh, 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 with the delta F, delta T larger uh, than one, which is a basic statement of uncertainty. This is what it's, it's saying. It's either you focus on one or you focus on the other. And in essence, the empirical question is this. Uh, we know that the brain is exquisite in processing all of this, certainly at the acoustic level, but I'm suggesting that this is going to be true about any other level of complexity. And is it so exquisite that it can even discriminate whether or not you, you should be representing information at the time uh, 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 slice or you should be representing information at the frequency slice, and both are useful. Both types of information are useful, as we see in consonants and vowels, and I will try to argue you get something very similar in predicates and, and, and arguments. That's, that's the gist uh, of, uh, of uh, the, the talk, and this is why I'm calling the second take-home message, that um, uh, correlated variables of this sort uh, like time and frequency. Of course, in other cases, you talk about other correlated variables, right? It could be position and momentum, but it doesn't matter what the, what the correlated variables are so long as you have them inside a wave, that that could be very useful in encoding essential information that the linguistic faculty, the language faculty carries. That's the basic idea. And that you do that, remember the first take home message was that you have feedback loops. So in essence, I'm, I'm going to be arguing that it, what you feedback loop is, is correlations of that sort over and over and over very rapidly to make sure that, yes, indeed, what I am hypothesizing is correct. Of course, I'm conscious. Um, now, the, the, we were talking half an hour ago about the tradition of linguistics and how brilliant minds over the eons have been coming up with insights of this sort. I like to credit Lucien Tenier uh, in the 1930s in, in France working on, on this, uh, what he thought of as an antinomy. Um, uh, eventually he published some of this in the 50s in French. I don't think it was translated in, into English until, if I'm not mistaken, until the late 1970s. So I know that many of my colleagues are not familiar with the fact that Tenier is uh, behind this basic insight, and of course he's behind uh, dependency grammars and a bunch of other uh, big ideas. He was a big thinker. But the basic uh, intuition that I, I like to uh, emphasize, and I've tried to emphasize in other domains, is the idea that part of the magic of language is that we have this uh, orthogonal uh, uh, computations. I mean, intuitively, what we have been talking about in speech is from before to after, right? So the the the, the um, the, the entropy of the system carries you forward in time. I mean, you, we're experiencing it right now as we talk. Uh, and the brain, the feedback loops then uh, basically, as you advance in speech, try to make sure, yes, you were targeting a vowel, that's correct. Now you're targeting a consonant, that's correct, etc. That's information that is uh, forward in time. But we also have an old idea that, again, probably certainly is in Aristotle, but, but you, I'm, from what I gather, you can get it in Panini and you can get it in many of the classics, that as you build your semantics, uh, you build them from the bottom up. That, that, you know, when you say, you know, Socrates believes that uh, uh, the earth is round, the order of predication uh, goes the opposite from what you're saying, or not even the opposite, it goes orthogonally, right? Because you, if you believe that the earth is round, you first have to get the earth is round to somehow compose and, and, and put it up. And I'm actually not talking now 
um, about the issue uh, that uh, Dr. Davir Moghadan w- w- was talking about in terms of how this materializes in different languages and whether it's with head last and head uh, first and so on. That's o- obviously very important. But the logic is that in all those cases, you still need to first do the composition of whatever is saying the complement and then going further up. Uh, so 10 years point, at some point, he says something like, whoever resolves this antinomy will square the circle of language, something along those lines. Uh, so, so I want to live on that, uh, on that tension, and I want to explore it for uh, a second. Um, I, uh, I did, uh, about 10 years or so ago, I, uh, and pardon my image of, of bullfighting, is, is, uh, no, I'm not just trying to be culturally inappropriate, but it is an interesting version of how... Uh, what uh, Philip Binder calls from material science, how what he calls dynamical frustration, in some instances, few instances, uh, yields a kind of dynamical dance that is extremely uh, uh, stable. Um, so uh, dynamical frustration instances, you get them in spin, spin glasses. I mean, the images I had at the beginning of the talk are uh, uh, spin glass images. But take take a a simple uh, bullfighting situation, which is also very old, at least in the the Mediterranean. Um, Now, in those situations, you have two forces, two opposing forces, right? And uh, the magic, whatever, if you want to think of it that way, happens when when the situation is not, um, uh, doesn't end up in a disaster but ends up in a sort of dance. You can think of, I'm sure, of, of less dramatic examples than this. My idea uh, a few years ago, uh, in, in part in work with Massimo Piatelli Palmarini, was to suggest that, well, we actually, uh, the old idea from Tenier uh, can be materialized this way if we think of the traditional minimalist uh, model going back to the 70s, the, the Y model that you get at the top of this slide, if you turn around the PF uh, component, so instead of splitting into two interface uh, uh, arrows, uh, you think of uh, conceptual and uh, uh, phonetic as literally clashing, and then that generating LF. Same topology, but you've turned around the PF, and uh, that produces, uh, that presupposes that the information comes from two different, ultimately, uh, brain domains, and it literally uh, clashes, and then it produces an LF output. This is why I was saying it's sympathetic with what we were hearing before, because th- clearly this has to be intermodular. If this is, I mean, not intermodular, inter, inter, uh, uh, interactional, right? It, and then some, in, in that the very structure emerges in the interaction. That's that's the idea. Now, if, uh, if that model is uh, taken seriously, um, the feedback loops are very important because in principle, those uh, interactions could happen uh, at multiple uh, at multiple domains of information encoding. Um, and of course, the first hypothesis should be that some of the markers we already have, th- this in the slide are from the, r- the last 20 something years where we know that you know, certain things happen at 200 milliseconds, certain things happen at 400 milliseconds. How do we know? Well, because people like Doug and others have been looking at this very carefully for decades now, and they tell us, look, uh, there's uh, P600 and there's, and so on. So I'm I'm suggesting let's take those domains, the consensus domains quite seriously. Let's presume that those are feedback places where where the system, the analysis by by synthesis in the system is checking that things are right. And let's go with a hypothesis that actually uh, Angela Federici explicitly uses in in her book that this uh, layers, temporal layers, ought to correlate with acoustics, uh, roughly speaking, right? Acoustics, uh, phonetics, morphosyntax, uh, s- semantics, pragmatics. They, they, that's sort of the, the uh, sequence you hope to be roughly correct. And it all happens within one second, um, so, so quite fast. So, so that's, that's the basic model that I am suggesting uh, we attempt. And bear in mind that there's a couple of different ways in which that model could go wrong, right? So if the feedback is too fast, 
you get that poor fellow that didn't quite dance with uh, the bull. That's the metaphor, but something quite similar could happen in principle in each of those domains of brain uh, information processing. I'll return to that later because I have a couple of speculations of what might be happening when it's too fast. And of course, it could be that it's too slow. That's the opposite situation where the the two, this actually happens uh, many times in wolf fighting where they just don't want to fight. They just, uh, you know, run away from each other. That's fine. Um, uh, and in, 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 of course, in the question of bullfighting, that's just totally fine. But in the question of brains, if, if the information is fed back uh, too late, that's another place where you wouldn't get the stability uh, that, that you wish to get. Anyway, so that's that's the general uh, idea. And uh, from this perspective, if, if anything like this is even uh, remotely on track, you should um, think of syntax, our beloved syntax, as just the way in which information is packaged so that these dynamical frustrations happen efficiently, whether it is acoustically, morphophonemically, and so on. And there might be more than one way to, 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 to do this. I mean, I certainly it seems as if there is serious uh, uh, variations that um, we have been looking at for, for centuries, and nothing in the system I'm suggesting prevents that. In fact, it suggests that it ought to have variation, shouldn't be as monolithic as, say, apparently the visual system is, um, or even the motor system is quite monolithic in terms of uh, gates and so on. I mean, we all have personal gates, but it is not, they don't coalesce into language gates, or at least it's not obvious that they do, or language-like visual systems. But the linguistic systems, surely they do. We have uh, thousands of language uh, languages. So the idea would be that the way of optimally meeting those requirements may actually be satisfied in a couple of different optima at, at each of those uh, various levels. That's that's the thought uh, for what it's worth. Um, okay, so um, moving then into how... Um, uh, there's a lot of promissory stuff here, obviously, right? Because you know, the language we use to describe the syntax of phonology, the syntax of morphology, the syntax of syntax, and, and so on, the, the interactions are quite different, right? I mean, in, in, in phonology, you have harmony and, and stress uh, patterns and so on, whereas in, in, uh, in semantics, well, you're going to have, I don't know, the conservativity of quantifiers, etc. This is all fine, of course, but I am attempting to see... Uh, deep underlying regularities of the sort I was talking about 20 minutes ago where, with correlated variables to see whether we can get residues of those as we observe these uh, realities at the level of uh, uh, brain signals, okay? Um, so um, the, the thing to bear in mind here, and I'm not going to have time to go into this now, so this is part of what... Uh, 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 this is part of what Mustafa was alluding to in the, in, the, in the syntactic model I've been working with. In part, I've been working with him on, on some of these issues. Um, it is not accidental from this perspective that if we are correct linguists, uh, for example, the X-bar theory uh, is, is present, is, is, is a fundamental way of organizing syntax. From the perspective I'm taking, that turns out to be the optimal solution uh, uh, in terms of the matrix uh, uh, representation of the output uh, tree. The topology of the tree that you get is called a Lindemeyer tree. Uh, if, you, uh, if it has the X-bar form, as uh, David Medeiros showed in his thesis, mm, then it corresponds to a... Uh, Basically, it's a Fibonacci type. Um, it's a Fibonacci type uh, representation that has the optimal uh, continuous fraction. That one plus one over one plus one over. There, there is no simpler continuous fraction. For instance, the square root of two, uh, which is an, it gives you another uh, growth rate that is irrational, is not going to be one plus one. You're going to have to start using ones and twos and so on. You could you could get any rational number represented by uh, continuous fractions, but there's only one that is going to give you only ones in 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 your uh, in your representation. Anyhow, the claim is that 
the X bar theory is if, if in a system of binary branching gives you the optimal answer. And of course, you would have to make similar claims for each of the um, relevant levels. So for instance, if conservativity of quantifiers is the way uh, language works, and it seems to, uh, well, then you would have to argue that, that in some sense, like this one, that is the optimal solution at that particular level within whatever, P600 or whatever level of analysis it is. It's going to be more complex than this one. Okay, that's that's the gist of uh, the logic of the explanation you would need. Uh, now, as I was saying, it is easy to find acoustic waves uh, or brain physiological waves. Right? This is this is part of what we do all the time. Now, the question though is, um, how do you communicate between those waves and familiar trees uh, that we were talking about? Uh, you know. 45 minutes ago, right? I mean, I, I'm assuming those trees. I'm not taking any issue whatsoever with those. The question is, uh, how, do, how do those things uh, talk to one another? Much of what I'm trying to do in, in matrix syntax is show that at the relevant level of abstraction, these things, uh, the topology of these things is the same. That's, that's, that's the gist of that uh, project. But that said, how does that even begin to, to work? Now, in some instances, um, this is more obvious than it may seem. Take sign languages. Uh, and I would love if anybody in the audience uh, knows or speaks uh, a sign language of a different kind. That th These are American sign language, uh, Libras from uh, spoken in Brazil, French uh, as, as system. In all of these systems, um, this is actually the, the sign for help, uh, uh, help me. And typically, uh, the, the emphasis I'm trying to give you here is this. In all these different languages, there is a motion that the verb uh, represents. The verb isn't static. Um, so the me part, uh, in, in the case of me, because the speaker is so present, you don't even have to point. You could, it would be emphatic, but even just bringing it towards you already indicates that you are the endpoint. But whereas you, the static endpoint, has that uh, uh, you know, monolithic, uh, rigid uh, endpoint, the verb itself is it has an action of some, of, of uh, uh, has a displacement of some sort, okay? So that already suggests that there is something dynamic about the verb. Um, in, in this case, I'm just taking the, the predicate part vis-a-vis -vis the argument part, right? So think of the argument part as pointing and think of the verbal part as uh, the dynamics. So I'm trying to liken that to a vowel versus a consonant. That's that's the, that, that's the sort of idea that that little... Uh, cartoon there about time and frequency is attempting to suggest. And I'm saying it's not crazy for sign languages. And I would even argue it is not crazy uh, both syntactically and semantically for spoken languages. So first of all, uh, may, you, you can emphasize uh, verbs in ways that are dynamic in the, in the interesting sense where you go like, help me, and, and you elongate the verb. In a way that is not obvious, you could do it for uh, for the uh, for the argument, so so you could say help me, but then that gets a very different semantics. That is the focus uh, semantics. It's not like you elongate the me in any meaningful sense. Anyway, so I'm trying to get you an asymmetry between arguments and predicates, and I am trying to suggest that that's actually very consistent with the semantics we uh, typically assume for those aspects of our semantics that are predicational versus those that are rigid. Um, I mean, I'm here I'm just giving you a, a simple Neo-Davidsonian representation. You could do it in other representations, but the idea is that when you have a verb like help, the, uh, the semantic action of the verb has to uh, distribute itself through the entire uh, event uh, that you're describing. Whereas if you say help me, the me part is, is rigidly designating the speaker or help you could be the addressee or help John, it could be John. But the, the, uh, the rigidly designated argument is punctual uh, in a way that the, the predicate uh, function is distributed. And, and so that's, that's where I'm going with that idea. And um, um, basically this slide emphasizes that, uh, th that point, right? The, the arrows are basically there trying to tell you, look, these are going to be endpoints, whereas the distributed information is going to be all over. So in that sense, it is going to, in, in my hope, is that that's going to introduce correlated variables that you may then be able to uh, uh, Fourier analyze, just as we did consonants and uh, vowels. 
Um, it is certainly uh, not crazy to think of uh, a predicate as a um, probability wave. Now, you may think, oh, come on, you're, you're being fanciful here because, you know, after all, predicates are going to, sure, they're going to have a, a simple bell curve because of a normal distribution. So, I don't know, help uh, is going to be a holding uh, uh, of, I don't know, friends and family and neighbors. Those are going to, in all likelihood, be probable helpers that satisfy that help function, whereas, I don't know, enemies or businessmen or whatever you think are not very helpful, uh, may, may be a near zero probability uh, in a distribution. Uh, but if you actually go through different types of meanings of verbs, whether it's transitive help or intransitive okay. help. Uh, okay, yeah. we've got, I'm sorry, not that we're not enjoying this, we're loving this, but we've got like five minutes more. Yeah, okay. yeah. I, can, right. I can wrap it up. I'm, I'm, I'm at the wrapping point, so this is perfect. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, so in fact, this is really the, the, the punchline of what I'm attempting to tell you, that um, if, if you start then looking at different versions of help, um, transitive, intransitive, or, or help, uh, I can't help but do this as opposed to actual help, in each, each of those would be a further uh, uh, bell curve that is start affecting your probability. So... Punchline, it is not crazy, I believe, to, to treat the verb uh, that way. And if you're going to allow yourself that, then, then all the math that we were using in principle could extend here. And you could then, I mean, I, this is, I'm, I'm not going to bother you, you with the math, but we know how to look at, it, uh, uh, you know, ways and how they correlate uh, with, with the wave function. So this is really what um, I would be trying to do for all other representations, not just vowels, uh, but in this case, predicates. And in principle, you could raise similar questions about voice, about, uh, about pragmatics, etc. I want to end with uh, wrapping it up with this. I was saying, well, OK, so if this is the kind of um, system you, you have, what does it mean to be too early or too late in terms of um, uh, this analysis of the wave uh, fun function itself. Remember the, the, the bull that was too fast or too slow. My suggestion, if this is correct, is that um, that would give you, let me see if I find that slide. I guess it is here. That would give you situations where if it is too early, um, if you get start getting your information back, your waves informed and analyzed back too early, uh, my claim would be that you would have something in the schizophrenia spectrum, whereas if you do it too late, um, you're going to have something in the uh, autism spectrum. So the schizophrenia spectrum, basically, you would have to start, the hearing voices or hallucinating part would be basically the information is coming back to you too early, not at the expected uh, uh, places. So you start rationalizing that as, well, somebody's talking to me or, you know, angels are talking to me. Whereas in the other case, the information is coming back to you too late. So the idea would be, I'm alone in this world. I can't really get any feedback to see whether or not this is even on track. Anyway, that's the model. So I think that's a good place to stop and uh, let's open it to discussion. Thank you. Uh, wow, what a talk. So uh, I believe Einstein was right after all that time does go faster when you listen to something that you <laughs> want. So, <laughs> well, well, uh, Dr. Darbradam, uh, do you have any questions here? Because uh, I believe uh, you must do so. Uh, well, uh, uh, do you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can hear okay. you and you can, uh, you can switch your camera on. Okay, I will do that. Uh, Perfect. Uh, well, I should uh, uh, say that it was uh, uh, a very uh, illuminating uh, uh, talk. Uh, I enjoyed it uh, very much and very thoughtful, and uh, uh, especially uh, the notion of clash uh, in language uh, between uh, modules of language it uh, reminded me of uh, two other notions from the same uh, 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 school, maybe I should say, uh, that uh, uh, Tenier uh, uh, belonged to, the notions of equilibrium. 
the notion of equilibrium uh, when uh, different forces in language uh, uh, interact in a way and then uh, uh, a balance emerges out of that. Yeah. And uh, uh, maybe we should think of that also uh, 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 in the sense of uh, the optimality theory, uh, yeah. the, an optimati optimality theoric model of language, uh, very, there are constraints which uh, interact and then uh, uh, one wins, uh, so to speak. And uh, also uh, uh, we have the notion of, uh, in the Tenerian uh, uh, school, we have the notion of economy. When they talk about economy, uh, 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 they uh, take, for instance, uh, uh, the Susurian model of uh, syntagmatic and paradigmatic forces. So when they uh, clash, uh, uh, they create a, a kind of economy or balance uh, between these two uh, forces. So very interesting and uh, also uh, very interesting that uh, there is a, a parallelism uh, between entities of phonology, consonant vowel, and entities, uh, uh, arguments, and the, uh, and the verb, uh, that they, 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 they somehow uh, resemble each other. And this uh, uh, is uh, very much uh, uh, reminiscent of uh, 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 what Chomsky tells us uh, uh, in the sense of uh, uh, the Galilean style, uh, the Galilean style, uh, simplicity and generality. So you see simplicity and generality uh, uh, across the um, modules of language, phonology, morphology, semantics, syntax, and pragmatics. Thank you very much for your wonderful uh, talk. Uh, my pleasure. Apologies to the audience because this is the first time I was giving this, so it's it's not time yet properly. You have the you have the the powerpoints. So I'll be happy to correspond with any of you if there are doubts uh, or the million questions that we now all have because this is just a program, and I mean it, it could all be wrong, right? It's an idea that suggests well, if this is correct, we should start finding some of this correlates. Uh, ultimately, in, in brain signals, um, uh, that's the hope anyway. Okay. Well, obviously, it's wrong. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, Douglas, if you've got questions, or Diego, any of you guys, you're welcome. You, you can collaborate here. You can talk. No, I just want one of the things that Juan point raised, which I think is a really interesting point that comes out of his conceptualization of this set of problems, is that, uh, that syntax is actually um, sort of solving a multivariate problem and that there's probably no unique solution. Uh, there's going to be classes of solutions. Right. Um, and what we're typically doing when we're drawing trees, the kinds of things that we're committed for, these are heuristic notions, right? These are notational approaches to describing a set of possible solutions. That I think this is one of the really interesting aspects of Juan's approach, uh, that it provides a formalized way of thinking about uh, the idea that Synthesis is a set of solutions to to problems. Um, we'll come right. back to that later. Yeah. Right. Right. Thank you very much. I, I do have a question myself, Juan, if that's okay. Sure. The uncertainty you mentioned about the correlated variables uh, is it at any point reminiscent of um, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in physics? Oh, it, it is. Uh, it is the exact same mathematical notion, right? Um, put it this way. Let's go back for a second uh, to what Doug was saying about, um, you know. Just because things weren't complicated enough. Let's put Heisenberg well, no, into no, the game. But, okay. <laughs> but, to be, but to be clear, what, what was interesting about Heisenberg's principle 
wasn't the math. The math itself is is trivial. Even even someone like me, not knowing much math, can understand that when you have those correlated variables, you know, you do the partial derivative. Uh, you do a partial derivative. So you derive one or you derive the other, and that's to the uh, to the extent it. it you get information on one side, lose it on the other. Now, the big thing with Heisenberg was to apply that to uh, the nature of the electron and to, and eventually, or through de Broglie, to apply that to the nature of mass. That was mind-boggling, still is mind-boggling, because we don't understand what it means for uh, a classical world. And so on. I mean, understand in a philosophical sense. We don't know what to make of it. Now, in the case of information, these things are, and this, this is all, you know, garden variety discussions that happen um, uh, certainly at the level of basic classic information. And now you're getting a new set of discussion because people are beginning to ask these questions for quantum information. I'm not taking a view on this here. Uh, in fact, I think it's a very interesting question to what extent the brain itself, th th this is a discussion I've had with Doug and with Diego, to what extent the brain itself is uh, going to, to quantum extremes or not, or is staying classical. I mean, it's probably a dialogue because after all, I'm hoping that my image of you that I have today is no different from the one I had a week ago and you're the same person. So there's, our memories have to be classical in some regard and let alone, I mean, my use of the verb help, I hope it's, it's the same now than it was 20 minutes ago. So that, that aspect seems quite classical. At the same time, we access all of this so fast and we build this um, very rapid representations. I mean, think of it this way. If, I, if, if what I said is even remotely on track, every second that is coming out of my mouth, you guys are processing a huge amount of information super fast, accessing your lexicon, spitting out uh, recalibrations. And in that sense, I think it is correct that this is very much like optimality theory or harmony grammar, right? Because you're basically living in that space. Now, so so what is the dialogue here? How much of it is uh, Hilbert, Hilbert space-like and super fast, a vector space, and how much of it is classical? Um, I, don't, I don't know the answer. I'm actually hoping to get uh, both Diego and, and, and Doug to collaborate on, on attempting to, to get closer in that question. It's a tough one, but I think it is the right question. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, it's five. Well, fortunately, because Diego is going to be here. Right. But sadly, it's five twenty, and you're going to have to say a goodbye for now to you. Thank and, you. Uh, oh, so we, we can see Diego. Thank you very much, Juan. That was just uh, like always wonderful and mind blowing. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.